Hello and welcome to My Come Follow Me in 20-ish Minutes. This lesson is Helaman 1 through 6, which is to be studied August 17th through the 23rd, 2020. I'm Rick Phillips and in these videos I share my thoughts and more importantly the study information about the main lesson points from the Come Follow Me manuals. PDF versions of the presentations can be found at the website link below this video by clicking the Show More link. Once on the website, make sure to click on the PDF icon, not the scripture references, to download. If you have any questions, please email me at mycomefollowme at gmail. From the Come Follow Me manuals, I'll be discussing these four lesson points. Pride separates us from the Spirit and strength of the Lord. Sanctification comes from yielding our hearts to God. If we make Jesus Christ our foundation, we cannot fall. Our faith is strengthened by the greatness of the evidences we have received. Here's a brief overview of these chapters. After Pehoran died, contention arose among the Nephites regarding who should be the next chief judge. His son, Pehoran, was also appointed by the voice of the people. However, the new chief judge was murdered by Kishkumen, who acted as part of a secret combination. Taking advantage of this contention and division, the Lamanites conquered the capital city of Zarahemla. The Nephites regained Zarahemla, and Kishkumen was slain while attempting to kill Helaman, son of Helaman, the new chief judge. During this time of Book of Mormon history, the Nephites enjoyed periods of peace but also experienced times of contention. Tens of thousands of Nephites joined the church during this time of peace. Following this interval of great prosperity, pride began to enter in the hearts of the people. However, the more humble members of the church grew in faith, despite being persecuted by those who were proud. Because of the wickedness among many of the Nephites, they lost all of their southern lands to the Lamanites. The Nephites continued in wickedness until the majority of them chose wickedness over righteousness. Nephi and Lehi devoted themselves to the preaching of the word of God. Their father Helaman had taught them to remember their Redeemer and to make him the foundation of their lives. After teaching the Nephites, Nephi and Lehi preached to the Lamanites who cast them into prison. The Lord miraculously delivered them and the majority of the Lamanites repented and converted to the gospel. Following Nephi and Lehi's missionary efforts, the Lamanites increased in righteousness. However, the Nephites became wicked and began supporting the Gadiant robbers, and the Spirit of the Lord withdrew from them. These chapters take place about 52 to 23 years before the birth of Christ. President Benson was called as a prophet while I was in college, and I just loved his teaching on the Book of Mormon and stressing the importance for us of study each and every day. I bought this book many years ago, Witness and a Warning, A Modern Day Prophet Testifies of the Book of Mormon, and he, it's always been one of my favorites as he talked about the importance. And he says, perhaps no portion of the Book of Mormon will better prepare a people for the second coming than Helaman through 3 Nephi 8, the record of the years prior to the destructions accompanying Christ's crucifixion and his visit to the Nephites. Commenting upon this portion of the Book of Mormon, President Benson wrote, in the Book of Mormon, we find a pattern for preparing for the second coming. By carefully studying that time period, we can determine why some were destroyed in the terrible judgments that preceded his coming and what, others, what brought others to stand at the temple in the land of Bountiful and thrust their hands into his wounds and his hands and his feet. A few years ago, when I was studying the Book of Mormon and got into these chapters of Helaman and 3 Nephi, I decided that I would just make my own spreadsheet of what was going on and really the cycle of war and peace and what caused that. And it was really great for me to do that. And as I was going through them, I, I was thinking these are even better than any Jason Bourne or Mission Impossible movie with all the intrigue and murders and everything going on during this time that uh, Mormon really explains for us in our day. And so you can just see the cycles I put in here. And then here's third Nephi just showing again uh, the chapters of war and then peace for a while. And then of course, all the destruction that we get in third Nephi eight that we'll talk about in a few lessons and then Christ a visit to them. Now on to the lesson points. Number one, pride separates us from the spirit and strength of the Lord. In Helaman 3, we read, And it came to pass 
And in the same year, the 49th year, there was exceedingly great prosperity in the church inasmuch as there were thousands who did join themselves unto the church and were baptized unto repentance. And so great was the prosperity of the church and so many blessings which were poured out upon the people that even the high priests and the teachers were themselves astonished beyond measure. I love that. And it came to pass that the work of the Lord did prosper unto baptizing and uniting to the church of God many souls, yea, even tens of thousands. And a few verses later, and it came to pass that the fifty and second year ended to peace also, save it were exceedingly great pride, which had gotten into the hearts of the people, and it was because of their exceedingly great riches and their prosperity in the land, and it did grow upon them from day to day. I love how Mormon adds that from day to day, just building a little bit here and there. We see a picture from the Come Follow Me manual and many other manuals about the Book of Mormon pride cycle, where on the right hand side there we're righteous and have prosperity. And then we start to develop that pride and wickedness leads to destruction and suffering. And then we cycle to humility and repentance. In Helaman 4.12, the 61st year, it says, and it was because of the pride of their, of their hearts, because of their exceeding riches, yea, it was because of their oppression to the poor, withholding their food from the hungry, withholding their clothing from the naked, and smiting their humble brethren upon their cheek, making a mock of them that was that which was sacred, denying the spirit of prophecy and revelation, murdering, plundering, lying, stealing, committing adultery, rising up in great contentions, and deserting away from the land into the land of Nephi among the Lamanites. Well, we certainly see this in similar things in 2020. President Benson said, think of what pride has cost us in the past and what is now costing us in our own lives, our families, and the church. Think of the repentance that could take place with the lives changed, marriages preserved, and homes strengthened if pride did not keep us from confessing our sins and forsaking them. Think of the many who are less active members of the church because they were offended and their pride will not allow them to forgive or fully sup at the Lord's table. Think of the tens of thousands of young men and couples who could be on missions except for the pride that keeps them from yielding their hearts unto God. Think of how temple work would increase if the, the time spent in this godly service were more important than the many prideful pursuits that compete for our time. Elder Uchtdorf in his great talk, Pride in the Priesthood, taught us, perhaps there is no better laboratory to observe the sin of pride than the world of sports. I've always loved participating in and attending sporting events, but I confess there are times when the lack of civility in sports is embarrassing. How is it that normally kind and compassionate human beings can be so intolerant and filled with hatred towards an opposing team and its fans? I've watched sports fans vilify and demonize their rivals. They look for any flaws and magnify it. They justify their hatred with broad generalizations and apply them to everyone associated with the other team. When ill fortune afflicts their rival, they rejoice. Brethren, unfortunately, we see today too often the same kind of attitude and behavior spill over into the, the public discourse of politics, ethnicity, and religion. Oh, that is so true. My dear brethren of the priesthood, my beloved fellow disciples of the gentle Christ, should we not hold ourselves to a higher standard? As priesthood holders, we must realize that all of God's children wear the same jersey. Our team is the brotherhood of man, this mortal life is our playing field. Lesson point number two, sanctification comes from yielding our hearts to God. In Helaman 3, it states, And in the fifty and first year of the reign of the judges, there was peace also, save it were, for the pride which began to enter into the church, not into the church of God, but into the hearts of the people who professed to belong to the church of God. Interesting juxtaposition there. And they were lifted up in pride, even to the persecution of many of their brethren. Now this was a great evil, which did cause the more humble part of the people to suffer great persecutions and to wade through much affliction. Nevertheless, they did one, fast and pray oft, and did two, wax stronger and stronger in their humility and firmer and firmer, number three, in their faith of Christ, unto the filling of their souls with joy and consolation, yea, even to the purifying and the sanctification of their hearts, which sanctification cometh because of number four, yielding their hearts unto God. From the Come Follow Me manual, it says, Sanctification is a process of becoming free from sin, pure, clean, and holy through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Once we have truly repented, Christ will take away the burden of guilt from our sins. 
we can know for ourselves that we have been forgiven and made clean. The Holy Ghost will verify this to us. He is the sanctifier. No other testimony of forgiveness can be greater. We remember from Alma the Younger talking about a few chapters ago that he would remember his sins, but the guilt and the pain was taken away from when he was a, a bad younger man and committing things when he was talking to his son. Continuing, it says, To be sanctified through the blood of Christ is to become clean, pure, and holy. If justification removes the punishment from past sin, then sanctification removes the stain and effects of that sin. Lesson point number three. If we make Jesus Christ our foundation, we cannot fall. Helaman 5.12, which is a scripture mastery scripture from seminary, says, And now, my sons, remember, remember, that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation, that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, when all his hell and mighty storms shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. Because of the rock upon which ye are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon, if men build, they cannot fall. Elder Neil L. Anderson stated, My young friends, the world will not glide calmly towards the second coming of the Savior. The scriptures declare that all things shall be in commotion. Brigham Young said, It was revealed to me that in the commencement of this church, that the church would spread, prosper, grow, and extend, that in the proportion to the spread of the gospel among the nations of the earth, so would the power of Satan rise. More concerning than the prophesied earthquakes and wars are the spiritual whirlwinds that can uproot you from your spiritual foundations and land you, your spirit in places you never imagined possible, sometimes with you barely noticing that you have been moved. The worst whirlwinds are the temptations of the adversary. Sin has always been part of the world, but it has never been so accessible, insatiable, and acceptable. There is, of course, a powerful force that will subdue the whirlwinds of sin. Whirlwinds of sin. It is called repentance. Not all of the whirlwinds in this life are of your own making. Some come from because of wrong choices of others, and some come because of this is just mortality. Here's a picture of one of my places of protection from the storms of the evil one the Las Vegas Temple, and I love how this picture from Las Vegas, or from LDS Temple Photography shows it with the, the strip in the background. Such a uh, interesting contrast for sure. I've certainly missed going to the temple during this quarantine time, but love our Las Vegas Temple and the beautiful spirit I feel and the protection I feel therein. The final lesson point, our faith is strengthened by the greatness of the evidences we have received. I'm going to read part of a story about Nephi and Lehi that's just really miraculous and amazing. It reminds me of some of the events and stories from the Old Testament. And it came to pass that they, Nephi and Lehi, were taken by an army of the Lamanites and cast into prison, yea, even in that same prison in which Ammon and his brethren were cast by the servants of Lehi. And after they had been cast into prison many days without food, behold, they went forth into the prison to take them that they might slay them. And it came to pass that Nephi and Lehi were encircled about as if by fire, inasmuch that they durst not lay their hands upon them for fear, lest they should be burned. Nevertheless, Nephi and Lehi were not burned, and they were, as standing in the midst of fire, were not burned. And when they saw that they were encircled about with the pillar of fire, and that it burned them not, their hearts did take courage, for they saw that the Lamanites durst not lay their hands upon them, neither durst they come near them, but stood as if they were struck dumb by with amazement. And it came to pass that Nephi and Lehi did stand forth and began to speak unto them, saying, Fear not, for behold, it is God that hath shown unto you this marvelous thing, in that which is shown unto you, that ye cannot lay your hands on us to slay us. And now when they had heard this, they, did, they cast up their eyes, as if to behold from whence the voice came. And behold, they saw the heavens open, and angels came out of heaven and ministered unto them. And they were about there were about three hundred souls who saw and heard these things, and they were bidden to go forth and marvel not, neither should they doubt. And it came to pass that they did go forth and did minister unto the people, declaring throughout the regions of the of round about all the things which they had heard and seen, inasmuch the more part of the Lamanites were convinced 
of them because of the greatness of the evidences which they had received. I just find this amazing that the Lord would use this miraculous power. Sometimes we pray for our loved ones or others to have certain these kind of events to take place in their lives. But, you know, Heavenly Father seems like he uses them very sparingly. But wow, what an amazing story. Our amazing and wonderful Elder Holland once said to those who struggle with their faith, you have more faith than you think you do because of what the Book of Mormon calls the greatest of evidences. The fruit of the living gospel is evident in the lives of the Latter-day Saints everywhere. From an Enzyme article in January 2000 called Mounting Evidence for the Book of Mormon, Brother Daniel C. Peterson states, Serious study of the Book of Mormon by Latter-day Saints is flourishing today as never before. And I was thinking this was 20 years ago, and just the last few years of Come Follow Me, I feel has really enhanced the study of the scriptures for families and individuals. And he continues, and with more study, the book's sturdiness and richness and remarkable accomplishments of its translator, the prophet Joseph Smith, become more apparent for everyone to see. Of course, scholarship does not replace spiritual witness as a source of testimony. As Elder B.H. Roberts of the 70 said, the power of the Holy Ghost must ever be chief the source of evidence of the Book of Mormon. All other evidence is secondary. No arrangement of evidence, however skillfully ordered, no argument, however adroitly made, can ever take its place. I find Book of Mormon Central such a great resource as I study the Book of Mormon. As I was studying this lesson, I was reading this article from them, Five Compelling Archaeological Evidences for the Book of Mormon. I really like studying archaeology and, and geography, and particularly in studying the Book of Mormon. But of course, my main testimony came from the Spirit when I was very first on my mission in a flat in Australia one evening. As I prayerfully studied the Book of Mormon, I'd spent two months in the MTC learning Greek, even though I went to Australia, a lot of Greek people in Australia. And I just remember just praying to Heavenly Father one night as my companion had gone to sleep that I really wanted to share a strong testimony of the Book of Mormon and just pleaded with Heavenly Father just to give me that sure witness uh, that I could testify throughout the rest of my mission. And I just got that sweet, overwhelming feeling of its truthfulness and confirmation of the Spirit that night in Australia. In conclusion, here are some of the likens I got from this lesson. As a natural man, the study of the Book of Mormon will help me combat worldly pride. Sanctification is a lifelong process, not a one-time event. Jesus Christ is my rock and redeemer, daily tethered to him. My faith has been strengthened by the Spirit and also the evidences of around me. So many evidences around me to bless and strengthen my faith in this special time in studying the gospel and especially the Book of Mormon as we prepare for the second coming of our Savior. In his sacred name, Jesus Christ. Amen.